This is the first of three C1 media screencasts exploring media representations agenda. And this obviously continues the work that we've been doing on media representations. And remember, so far we've been looking at media representations of ethnic minorities and also media representations of social class. So gender uh, is the next topic uh, within this particular theme. And in the next two screencasts, we're going to focus on media representations of women. And in this video, we're going to look at how women have traditionally been depicted uh, within the media. So we're going to look at how women have often been invisible within the media. In other words, how they've been underrepresented. And we'll also look at various ways in which women traditionally have been misrepresented by looking at some of the stereotypes that are typified uh, depictions of women within the media. And then in the next screencast, we'll look at recent developments, we'll look at the media over the last decade or so to see whether or not there have been any changes, to see whether or not women are now more visible in the media and whether or not there's been any move away from some of the traditional stereotypes. So let's begin by looking at the theme of underrepresentation. And feminist sociologists have argued that women uh, in the media traditionally have been represented in a narrow range of social roles by various types of media, whilst in contrast men have been shown performing uh, a full range of social and occupational roles. And we can use this term, symbolic annihilation, uh, to describe the underrepresentation, the invisibility of women uh, in certain social roles within the media. And Tuchman also used this term, symbolic annihilation, to describe the way in which women's achievements are often uh, not reported in the media or are trivialised by the mass media. So often the achievements of women are presented as being less important uh, than things like their looks. So traditionally, men have been presented in a wider range of roles which have no particular reference to their gender. Whereas in contrast, women's roles often involve being women first. In other words, uh, women often play limited roles restricted to certain gender stereotypes, particularly those related to the housewife role or to motherhood. And we can see this if we think about uh, advertisements for things like washing up liquid or washing powder which nearly always show mothers and small daughters working together and boys and men are usually the ones who are covered in dirt. And the sociologist Ferguson uh, conducted a content analysis of women's magazines from the end of World War II uh, through to 1980 and she noted that such magazines are organised around what she calls uh, the cult of femininity. Uh, and what she means by this is the promotion of a traditional ideal where excellence uh, is achieved through caring for others, uh, the family, marriage and concern for appearance. And Ferguson argues that although uh, modern female magazines, especially those aimed at teenagers, are beginning to move away from these traditional stereotypes, they still tend to focus narrowly on him, home and looking good for him. A really good example of the symbolic annihilation of women's activities is the media coverage of women's sport in newspapers and on the television. So research carried out by the Women's Sport and Fitness Foundation uh, found that there was very little coverage of women's sport uh, within the mainstream media and where there is coverage there's a tendency to sexualise, trivialise and devalue women's sporting achievements. So if we look at this image from The Guardian entitled A Few Stories You Won't Be Reading About the Tennis Stars at Wimbledon uh, if they're male. Obviously the point that they're trying to make here is that when it comes to uh, female athletes a lot of the coverage focuses on how they look, on aspects of their body, uh, presents them in a very sexualized way 
rather than focusing on their sporting achievements. Let's now have a look at some of the traditional stereotypes and myths about femininity that are characterised media representations of women. And I think a really good example uh, to highlight some of the traditional stereotypes about femininity are animated Disney films. So perhaps before uh, we go any further, hit the pause button and have a think about the female characters in Disney movies and how they might present the audience with a highly distorted version of femininity. So in his book, The Mouse That Roared, Henry Giraud argues that if we look at the female characters in Disney movies, a consistent theme is they present the audience with a very narrow, restrictive and distorted version of femininity. So we often see uh, highly sexualised bodies, uh, coy seductiveness, uh, women that always need to be rescued uh, by a stronger male character. We've got the example of Snow White, who cleans the dwarf's cottage to ingratiate herself. Uh, we've got uh, Ariel, uh, who gives up her voice in order to win the prince with her body in The Little Mermaid. We've got Mulan here, who almost single-handedly wins the war, uh, only to return home to be romanced. And then we've got Beauty and the Beast, uh, where we've got um, the character Belle, who endures an abusive and violent beast in order to redeem him. And I'm sure you can think of many examples of your own from animated Disney films. And one of the things to have a think about is whether or not you think those stereotypes have changed in more recent Disney movies, or whether or not we're still seeing the same consistent themes emerging. And the image that you can see on the screen at the moment of Snow White as a scientist uh, is from a work completed by the Eastbourne artist Sarah Maple uh, in a piece of work that she entitled It's a Girl. So in this work, Sarah Maple dresses as a series of Disney princesses uh, taking on some very un-Disney-like roles. And she said that she did this piece of work because she wanted to empower the princesses and to show people that there was more to femininity than looking beautiful and waiting to be saved by a man. Another obvious way in which women are stereotyped within the media uh, is as sex objects. Sex objects to be consumed by what Laura Mulvey has called the male gaze. And the male gaze is where the camera lens essentially eyes up the female characters, uh, providing erotic pleasure uh, for men. So Laura Mulvey, whose main interest was in cinema, stated that women were objectified in film because heterosexual men were in control of the camera and that Hollywood films played uh, to a kind of voyeuristic uh, tendency. In other words, the male gaze occurs when the camera puts the audience into the perspective of a heterosexual man. So the camera may linger over the curves of a woman's body, for instance, and the woman is usually displayed on two different levels um, as an erotic object uh, for both the characters within the film, um, in addition to being an erotic object for the spectator who is watching the film. And this means that the man emerges as the dominant power uh, within the creative film fantasy and the woman is passive to the active gaze from the man. And there's plenty of evidence of this concept of the male gaze being used as a framing device in other uh, sections of the mass media apart from cinema. So if we think about advertising, uh, very often uh, within advertising, the male gaze structures the image, as we can see uh, in this particular advertisement. And usually this male viewer is implied in the construction of the image. But as we can see uh, in this advertisement, sometimes he's explicitly uh, placed in the image. 
And here's another very clear example of this concept of a male gaze. So in this advertisement, we've got a woman uh, posing for herself in the mirror, uh, but very self-conscious, very aware of her own image uh, under the male gaze. And a very common way of creating the male gaze in advertising is to reduce the female body to pieces. And this targets the gaze to a specific and generally uh, sexually stimulating part of the body. And if all we see is a piece of body, how can we imagine that it actually belongs to a whole person who is more than just a shiny leg, a shapely thigh, a skinny stomach or wonder bra breasts?